from Austria and your and India. Uh, I'm Munish Bell working for the Austrian Culture Forum. Next to me is the charge the affairs of the Austrian Embassy, Mr. Matthias Radostec. And we are very happy that among us is Dr. Sachidanan Joshi, Member Secretary of IGNCA, uh, with whom we have been doing now plethora of programs together. And uh, this is one evening where we are doing ethnic migration, 15 years of Roma from India to present day Austria. Before I go any further, I would rather say it's a sort of a, a happy occasion that we have come up with another uh, uh, another uh, uh, lecture on uh, in our uh, lecture series of Austrian Embassy, where we show the amalgamation of the two countries' culture, not from today but from yesteryears. But on the other hand, it's going to be a sad uh, time for, for us that the person with whom we used to work is going to attend this particular lecture for the last time. Uh, Mr. Radostic, the Shashti affair of the Austrian Embassy who had been working with us on this number of other programs and had been a key uh, key person in letting the whole show go on will be leaving us soon for his next posting. Uh, Mr. Radustesh, thank you very much. Not only from my side, but from the friends who are over here. And that's why we brought this particular program where we have not only a lecture or talking or verbose, but we have some music also. And the music is coming direct from Austria, where one of the renowned and very famous musician, Harry Stoika, has taken out some time with his colleague Mr. Peter Stutzenberger and the band manager, Valerie, who would be uh, presenting some Roma music for us. And also at the same time, to enlighten us about the history, the movement of the uh, ethnic, uh, this ethnic movement, we have two renowned uh, personalities from Austria. We have Professor Dr. Halwax, Dieter Halwax, who will enlighten us not only with the minority languages, but other things which I keep myself and all of us away here. Uh, in a in a uh, in a secret format, so that he can uh, do the opening of the curtains, and then we also have Mrs. Miriam uh, 
who is Mar Mariam Karoli, sorry, who will be also telling us about the background of the movement of Roma mm -hmm. uh, from India to Austria. But before I move any further, I would like to hand over the mic to my friend, philosopher. I can also call him a guide, although he's younger to me, uh, Dr. Achal Pandya, to kindly take over and uh, proceed the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Munishji, for such a uh, really uh, high introduction for me. And uh, in fact, we both are complimenting each other and working uh, for the collaboration between uh, Austrian embassy, especially the cultural forum and uh, Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. So this is like, I think the fourth uh, cultural forum that uh, we are doing it together here at the IGNCA. And uh, before we start, I would, uh, I will invite Dr. Sachidanan Joshi, Member Secretary IGNCA uh, for the welcome address, please. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone present here in this, uh, here in this hall and uh, people who have joined on uh, uh, virtual mode from Austria. Uh, it's really my pleasure to welcome the Deputy Chief of the Mission, Mr. Matthias Radostich, who is a very close friend of uh, not only IGNCA, but uh, personally also. And uh, although he might have been posted to Austria, we wish him good luck. And uh, uh, we hope that he's going mm -hmm. on a promotion so that he, next time when he visits India, he comes with an elevated stitcher. So we wish him good luck for that. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Achal Pandya, uh, Professor Anil Kumar, Munish Bahel, uh, who, has, uh, who has been instrumental in organizing such events uh, in collaboration with the Austrian High Commission. And it's so kind of him to uh, really prefer IGNCA to host such kind of an event. Uh, and from Austria, uh, Dr. Halwash and Mariam Karoli, and of course, uh, the guitarist, Harry Stoika. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this important seminar based on the Roma community and their migration from India to Europe, including Austria. I look forward to an interesting panel discussion followed by some music, which is very interesting part of this entire panel discussion, because if we only discuss it theoretically, it becomes very dry. And if we have a pinch of, uh, pinch of music along with it, it really creates some kind of an interest. So it's really a novel idea and an experiment which we can follow in other panel discussions also. So we, as we all know, Roma community is, is relatively unsung community, which has given exceptional personalities like Charlie Chaplin or Reshma in India. And uh, uh, why I'm saying relatively unsung, because uh, not many people know really about their, uh, their lifestyle, their existence, their, uh, their basic nature and culture. Uh, so there needs to be a more comprehensive civilizational study of this community and I hope that this kind of discussion will definitely pave way for such uh, studies. I am sure my colleague, my friend, Professor Anil Kumar, who is an anthropologist and expert in civilizational studies, will also throw some light on that. Uh, today we will also listen to the experts from Austria who would definitely throw some light on these aspects and uh, this this can become an important bridge between india and austria uh, especially uh, related to diaspora studies uh, i had been to australia and my visit has been very memorable as far as the people living in austria is concerned so i mean that's an interesting study and definitely uh, such relationships such bonds are going to be stronger thicker as years to come. Uh, 
so uh, i hope that uh, today's panel discussion is going to be uh, another mm -hmm. milestone uh, in strengthening the relations between india and austria mm -hmm. and uh, i always say and i i will not hesitate in quoting again and again that's my statement until unless someone else claims for the copyright i always say that geography divides and culture unites so this is the cultural linkages which are most important and we, they they go beyond the boundaries they go beyond the barriers so there is no limitations as far as culture is concerned we as an institution devoted to the study of art and culture mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. have that kind of a, an advantage of going beyond the geographical boundaries and sort of discuss all these issues so i am i'm i'm sure that uh, we'll have more comprehensive studies in future as far as the cultural relationship between mm -hmm. india and austria is concerned uh, we definitely look forward uh, mm -hmm. to some kind of an expert advice mm -hmm. on various issues uh, may it be uh, archiving may it be museum mm -hmm. uh, conservation may it be other cultural aspects uh, we have some strong points as far as india is concerned and we are definitely Uh, eager to share our expertise in those fields uh, i must congratulate my colleague dr achal pandya for organizing such a beautiful panel discussion and again thank shri munish behel for being instrumental in making this my best wishes to everyone you and all thank you very much uh, before i uh, invite uh, Mr. Radostrich, uh, to speak something, I would request Dr. Sachidanand Joshi ji to uh, come kindly felicitate Radostrich ji uh, with uh, a small memento. You know, we are celebrating. Uh, Seventy-five years of uh, India's independence. And this is uh, as a from the embassy. And the fair and the farewell shot. <laughs> Now I would request uh, Dr. Sachidan Joshi ji to felicitate uh, Mr. Munish Pahal. Now I will request uh, Mr. Radostich to please say a few words. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank. Uh, it's hard to know whom to thank first. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Joshi, um, as you, as you pointed out, I mean we have collaborated for a long time. I remember some years ago; it was always some years ago. We had a poetry evening. You came and you recited some of your own poems, so that was very impressive. And uh, so we have uh, indeed a long cooperation, Dr. Pandya. He's become a real friend of the Austrian Cultural Forum. He is always with us, and we are always more than happy if he's with us. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, thank you very much, also Munish, who is the heart and the and the brain of the Cultural Forum, um, and for our guests in Austria. Why this is so important? This is a seventy-five mm -hmm. years uh, of India's independence uh, scout. So. Uh, And that's obviously a very, very, very important occasion in India, which we are celebrating for quite some time. And um, so, I don't want to keep you long. I mean, we have a series of that we call the occasional lectures, um, and this is uh, one part of this occasional lecture series where we try to um, speak about not in a scientific way, but in a kind of um, more popular way, understandable way about. Um, Things that we have in common, uh, personalities from Austria that contributed something to India, whatever it is, in in whatever field, or 
things where we overlap culturally, etc. So we thought in uh, uh, this is an excellent topic uh, because um, uh, the Roma people, obviously, they I mean coming from India, I think they can trace back their roots to Rajasthan, but we will. Uh, learn more about this a bit later. So um, this is indeed something that, that we have in common because uh, we do have a, a Roma community uh, living in, in Austria. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Harry Stoika who, who joins us um, even today. So um, this is a strong linkage that we want to shed a bit of a light on. And um, I don't want to keep you any longer, so we should get uh, into the substance. I'll hand over to Munish and he will guide us then together with uh, Achal uh, through the program. Thank you, Mr. Matthias Radostic, and thank you, Dr. Joshi, for lovely mementos. Uh, before I move further, I would like to say, Harry would definitely remember, but we have over here somebody who is expert on Roma community, or as they call over here, Banjaras and all from Rajasthan. We have Mrs. Rama Pandey with us over here. And uh, Harry, when he was here five to six years ago, the, they both dined together in uh, Rama's house. And uh, at that time, we came to know for the very first time that Harry's DNA was the same like uh, of Na Nangriyas, uh, of Mang Mangriyas of, uh, of Rajasthan. There was a uh, Saitan Blike film uh, maker who was making this film over here and he found out. Now, the background of uh, my, of of Romani or Ro Roman Romas is uh, different in different formats. In the people are saying some uh, different historians. They say something and all. So here I would like to start with Professor uh, Caroli to mm -hmm. kindly kindly throw some light as to what the what instigated the movement, where they had come from, and uh, something about your research work, which you have been doing so far. And I would also request Professor Halbach also to please join whenever he feels like to speak about the languages, the pattern of which were followed and uh, their background was distinguished and uh, were, were, were able to uh, uh, found out, uh, find out. So here I'll now request Dr. Mariam Karoli to kindly throw some light, please. to all the organizers, including the Cultural uh, Institute of uh, Austria and the, India, uh, the Austrian uh, Embassy in India for this event. It's actually very nice to hear that uh, we are connecting, uh, so to say, almost around the world uh, uh, with uh, discussing with Roma and actually uh, look, uh, looking about the roots and also the links we have uh, in, the, in the shared countries. So, um, for, for my own introduction, uh, I just want to say I'm Magister Miriam Karoli, I'm a political scientist. And um, uh, as a scientist, I have not done so much uh, research and work on historical facts as regards the migration or the movement of Roma um, uh, from India to uh, Austria or to Europe. However, I had in the morning a little discussion with uh, Dieter Halwachs and we agreed that I will just give a short snapshot about the history of Roma, also because I think it's maybe in a matter of like what I want you to take away from this uh, presentation is a little bit an understanding of what are we talking about if we talk about Roma people in Europe today. 
And uh, then uh, Dieter will um, elaborate a little bit more on the language and also what we know with regard to the movement from India to Europe or Austria, because actually um, this has been, uh, how to say, researched by linguists. So what we know today about the kind of tracing the way Roma came from India to Europe is because of uh, linguistic research. But before we start, uh, briefly also to my uh, person, I said that I'm a political scientist. I'm engaged at local and international level for over 20 years on Roma rights and human rights of Roma in Europe. I have worked in the lo local sphere with uh, Roma activists, with uh, Roma NGO civil society movement. I'm part of the Roma civil society movement in Austria. I'm also in the advisory board uh, assisting the Austrian government with regard to policies uh, regarding Roma. And I also have worked for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, an organization which encompasses 57 participating states. Uh, and they are also uh, on, as chief of the contact point for Roma and Sinti issues. So we assisted state policies in very actual human rights issues and also inclusion policies uh, for Roma. Um, maybe also a last point I want to make is I'm also part of the Austrian delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, something which I think important when it comes to the recognition of the Roma genocide, I'm engaged there too. So that you understand a little bit my background because you will see in my short presentation, um, these uh, topics will pop up again. I was asked to prepare 10 minutes to give a snapshot about Roma history and away from India to Europe. I almost saw this a mission impossible. So I decided to start with a little movie which I want to introduce to you. And before we start the movie, it's only two and a half minutes, but I think it does a great work in getting an idea because we have a long way to cover from India to Europe. Um, I just want to give you a few questions to think about before you watch the movie. And one is, what do we know about the dispersion? Where do Roma live today in Europe? Yeah. So maybe you have already an idea. I mean, think about it. The movie might give some answers. Also, if we talk about Roma, is it the Roma or is it a very heterogeneous, diverse community? And I think you will also get some ideas from the movie. And also, why is, for example, the Second World War important for Roma today, also still today? Yeah, What happened there? What uh, makes it very significant uh, for Roma today and also the situation we face today? With this, I would like uh, the organizers uh, to help me out by triggering the, <laughs> the starting uh, dot for the movie. The history of the Roma people is full of mix-ups. Even the term gypsy comes from a fairly imaginative leap some confused chaps made on first meeting the Roma. The Roma people's great 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 ancestors are actually from India, not Egypt. They first set off towards Europe somewhere between the 10th and 11th centuries. Then they travelled through Persia and Armenia to the Byzantine Empire of the 1100s, where they lived in tents and worked their well-worn trades. But the Byzantines were soon trampled by the Ottomans, and many Roma scarpered west, though the Ottomans actually proved far better host than the dastardly Europeans. The next few hundred years were a real Roma roller coaster. What is now Romania welcomed them with open arms, but these soon, soon grew tight around their guests and they enslaved them for 500 years. Then, over in Western Europe in the 1400s, the natives were initially thrilled with these, oh look, new gypsy pilgrims, but they soon changed their tune. By the 1700s, enlightened Spain thanked the Roma guests for giving them flamenco by rounding them all up into forced labour camps. Muchas gracias. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. They became fully-fledged subjects in the unusually groovy Russian Empire, and over in Ottoman Turkey, their metal skills made them pretty handy in the navy. 
It was around the time America abolished slavery that Romania got its act together and freed their Roma slaves too. Reluctant to stick around, the Roma journeyed on, reaching the Americas, South Africa and Australia. When World War I showed its ugly head, the Roma's skills in horsemanship came in very handy in what turned out to be the last truly horsey war. Austro-Hungary soon split and some unlucky Roma found they now lived in Austria, which was then annexed by Nazi Germany, where the Roma were soon being sterilised, experimented on and locked in concentration camps. The Romani word for Holocaust is porimos, which means devouring. Estimates of the Romani death toll ranged from a quarter of a million to one and a half million. Survivors had little help or compensation, and those seeking justice were cast off as liars. After the war, the Roma in communist countries gained a strange equality, the exact same tyranny and censorship as everyone else. Then the Roma got organised, establishing the International Romani Union and working today on health, employment and education. They've come a long way from persecution and slavery to be politicians and freedom fighters. But will our Roma heroes conquer prejudice and win their freedom worldwide? So thank you. I hope uh, this was enlightening a little bit about this uh, vast history and the long period of time of Roma in Europe, but also coming from India to mm -hmm. Europe. I have prepared two slides, which I will go through to, to kind of recapture the points made. So as I have asked before, um, what is the origin of Roma? I think you all know it. Uh, it has to do with this event. It's India. That's for sure something we know. Uh, so we know that Roma originate from India, that the road to Europe went through Persia, Armenia and Asia Minor as part of the Byzantine Empire. However, we don't know exactly what triggered the, this going away and also what, was, was, what triggered uh, the way in which kind of groups they, they left India. But uh, I guess Dieter will tell more about this uh, after me. What we know is that probably they have left in smaller groups and it was not a one go, but they, they stayed in different places at different times. So they have a common roots in, in India. This is a shared uh, part of the history. We also know that today they are the largest ethnic minority in U Europe, predom predominantly living in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, the estimates is, uh, of the whole size of the population is 10 to 12 million euro. If you look at the map, which you see there on the screen, you will see that uh, there where you have kind of the bigger sign of the wheel, we have a bigger population. You can see that uh, what I said, that uh, the majority lives in Central and uh, Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, uh, that we have a bigger population of Roma living in Romania, like for example, two and a half million. We have a bigger population also in Bulgaria, in Hungary, in Serbia, in Turkey, but also in, in Western Europe, in Spain, for example, with up to 500,000 uh, uh, Gitanos. You also see in the map Austria, which is uh, a little country. And today we think that the population of Roma is up to 50,000, but we don't know in fact, by evidence, this is something which is according to the estimations of self-organizations. So as you have seen, we have common roots in India. Also, there's a history of persecution throughout centuries. So wherever Roma arrived or the Romani groups, the different Romani groups arrived, they were first not welcomed, but often seen as animal, enemies and foreigners and were persecuted. Mm -hmm. People kind of uh, could even harm them and being free. So it was not seen as a crime uh, to kill a Romani person, for example. This culminated in, under the national socialism. And I think it was very much, uh, very good depicted in, in, the, in this very short movie where under the national socialism, around 500,000 Roma died either in concentration camps, in the persecution measures or because of uh, atrocities and killings. Um, 
what is interesting maybe, and also just a reflection to the Austrian history in Austria, for example, in 1938, as before the start of the Second World War, we had around only 8,000 uh, 8 to 11,000 Roma and Sinti people living in Austria and only 90% uh, of Roma survived the Holocaust. Uh, only 10%, sorry, survived the Holocaust, 19% 19, uh, 19 were killed. So of course, this left uh, a big trauma on the surviving community. And very typically, you could see this in Austria, but also in Germany and other countries, that uh, Roma were not seen as victims of the Holocaust, but it was seen that they were persecuted because of being asocial or criminals. So um, the, per, the discrimination, racism, and even the language of the perpetrators continued uh, after 1945. I put here also a shared uh, characteristic is resilience. Resilience therefore, because what I, was, what I just tried to say in, in very brief words is, that despite um, a, a long-term persecution or a history of uh, discrimination and racism, Roma became very resilient. They, they survived and had their own uh, strategies and struggles how to um, integrate in the different societies in their own countries. They definitely have also a shared common linguistic cultural um, and ethnic background, uh, something we will hear more um, from uh, Dieter Halwax. But I think it's also very important, and this is my, my second point, to reflect about diversity. For example, we see it in the term, we often use uh, Roma, Romani people as an umbrella term for many other groups. Sometimes uh, you will also see the term of Roma and Sinti as an um, 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 umbrella term, though in fact, it's a, it's a huge diversity and heterogeneity among the communities. Just to give an example, for example, in Austria, we speak about Roma Burgenland Roma, the group I belong to or my father comes from, which refers to a region. We also speak about the Lovara, a community which was uh, uh, traditionally engaged in horse trading, or about Calderasha, a, a community uh, which uh, is, uh, is um, experienced in, in coppersmithing. It comes even from the term calder, which means uh, a copper pot. Or even earlier, uh, signifying the, the religious background of a community, Muslim Roma, Gurbeti, or for example, the Sinti, a community which is uh, quite, quite dominant in the German sphere, but also represented in Austria and defines a group which was one of the first to integrate uh, to, to move to the German speaking sphere. Just to give a little bit an idea about the heterogeneity, we could also look, for example, about regional, urban, rural environments, which of course also influenced. So Roma were influenced also and had a cultural um, inter interference with the cultures and the nations they arrived with. This always left kind of a big influence on their own um, cultural expressions. As I said before, and something we even see today, uh, Roma do face till today pervasive racism and discrimination also in present day Europe. This um, is seen in, in almost all spheres of their life. Uh, as for example, in education, employment, in housing and housing segregation, in a general marginalization of their uh, communities within a country um, or within a context of conflict, for example. This is also, and that's quite interesting, why, for example, a number of international organizations have set up uh, specific uh, measures and policies or programs to support Romani people. Then also something shared by Roma in Europe today is uh, that we can look back on a strong Roma civil rights movement, which uh, started possibly later than others, but it started in, in European wide in the 70s, in, uh, in Austria in the 80s. And uh, for example, one of the results is that to date, in many countries, Roma recognized a minority, an ethnic minority or language minority, 
Um, they have uh, received support in uh, promoting their culture and language. We will hear also later, I guess, from Dita about what, uh, what was done in this regard in Austria. But also I think it helped us very much to network and stand up for our own rights. With this, I would like to come to my second slide here, um, which I called Opre Roma, Stand Up Roma. It says uh, it uh, stands for recognition of our people. And you see here, uh, actually, it's my daughter, Mika Karoli. It's part of uh, an initiative done by young Roma in Austria um, who, who are at university. And they created a, an association called Her in order to demonstrate uh, self-representation, self but also emancipation and try to change uh, the image of the Roma and the stereotypical image of the Roma in, in, in public. Um, I put her here because she, was, she wanted to be part of this uh, initiative. And um, she kind of, um, as, an, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a peer in, the, in her own school, she um, told me recently that there was a test about the Holocaust. And uh, the, it was a test about also who were the victims of the Holocaust and she put the Roma and her teacher inquired about this because this was something which was not part of the, the subject. And I think um, the story kind of for me signifies that actually change happens also through the people. And I think it's a very symbolic how we can also kind of stand up for our own rights and be part of a changing um, image of the Roma. I wanted to say this also at the very end because I found it very interesting when I looked at the invitation, uh, the picture which was shown there from Roma, maybe it's an old picture, but it's something we see still today in many newspapers. And I'm very happy that we have this exchange and opportunity now to talk about it because um, I think over this kind of maybe bridging from India to Europe, it also signifies a big transformation and change to today's situation. Uh, With this, I would, like... I would like to interrupt. Uh, you said the bridge between us, but I must tell you that there was an international conference which was held in 2016, where none other than the foreign minister of India at that time called Romas as children of India. And uh, this was, you know, something I would rather say, uh, which date backs not only uh, uh, to, to, to few years or few decades, but it goes back to thousand years or so. And uh, I think so in that case, uh, I would rather like to request uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Halvaks if he can throw some light on the movement of uh, these Romas from India uh, to, to, uh, to Europe and especially to Austria and how language had, you know, uh, been a part of this, uh, you know, major bridge now, I would rather say, you know, and how the Romas, they build up or how they picked up their religion on the way to Europe, you see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if I have to talk now, man, first of all, I, um, I'm here representing my teacher and friend, Moses Heinsching. You know, some of you, uh, uh, some of you know him, and he was also with Hari in India during the, the film. And as Moses doesn't want to talk uh, too much in public because he's quite old now, I have to represent him. And as I usually always have to represent him on the academic level. Uh, uh, and also he knows much more about Roma and Romani than all academics together. And that India is the homeland and of the Roma is quite known, but not to all Indians. I remember when I was working with my friend Indrajit Banerjee, the late, uh, uh, the late director uh, man at UNESCO, uh, he, man, he, and I told him that I have been working with, uh, with Romani language for some years. He said, what is Romani language? And I said, ah, it's a central Indo-Aryan language. Come on, uh, you should know it. And then uh, we started playing with it. And then we, man, he found out that 
he understands many words and it's, and it's similar with me. I don't speak Hindi, but if I see a Bollywood film, I understand now and then some words and some phrases because they are still similar. And this was also uh, the, the reason why the Roma left, uh, why the ancestors of the European Romani people uh, left India, we don't know. We have no, uh, we have until now, at least from a European point of view, uh, no hard facts what really happened. But as they are, uh, as they always were something like, uh, like uh, ambulance, ambulance service providers, it might have been that they lost the, uh, the basis for an existence uh, because uh, uh, Northwestern India and India sometimes uh, uh, was not so, uh, was not such a secure and uh, a ground for, uh, for making a living out of these professions and went uh, westwards to more safe and stable uh, uh, countries or, uh, or empires like the Sassanid Empire and so on and so on. Uh, this we also know, um, and, and, and as Miriam also said, this was never, uh, uh, they did not jump into a jumbo and flew to, uh, 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 to Tehran. This was a process over man, man, maybe over centuries because the Indo-Aryan West diaspora is not only limited to the Romani people, they are also the Dom of the Near East and the, and the Lomavren people uh, of the Armenian sphere. Uh, uh, who uh, who are not the same uh, the same movement than the Romani people who always uh, who also might have been many movements. The only thing we know is so Europe got interested in the Roma uh, in the uh, in the origin of the Roma at the same time when they were hunting them. Yeah, so this was in in our famous Baroque time where everybody uh, is praising the Austrian culture and the Middle European culture. Uh, the people were not only building, uh, 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 having cultural events, they were also going hunting. One day they hunted the deer, the other day they hunted the gypsy, and the next day they hunted the sow. But basically in this time, there were also people who got, who became interested in these outsiders, in these people uh, you could kill without being punished. And these people found out at this time already that it might uh, that the Roma speak something like an Indo-Aryan language, or as Bot said it, a language uh, which is closely connected, uh, which is a blood relative uh, to the proud Sanskrit. And it became quite. Uh, uh, this was, um, and I think this is known since hundred years. Also, academia was not very interested in it. It was it was only academic outsiders priests who were interested in the Roman uh, uh, in the people and first of all the police because they were interested in what are these people talking if they talk about us and we don't understand them uh, and it was under the British Raj that uh, in uh, that uh, the Roma became also uh, of interest for uh, for the British society so for the British uh, uh, for the British people and for the uh, uh, and for the British romanticists who were uh, searching for the true gypsy, which is still now the Gypsy Law Society today, and and these people found out that Romani is a central in its structure. It's a central. Uh, it's a central Indo-Aryan language, uh, which resembles uh, uh, which resembles Hindi and. And, and all uh, and the Hindustani languages. And it shares innovations with them, but it's also archaic compared to them. On the other hand, it, all, uh, it, it has something like, uh, uh, like innovative features from Northwest Indo-Aryan languages like Sindhi. So it was Turner uh, who also made the, uh, uh, the dictionary of the Indo-Aryan languages. Uh, who proved that there might have been, and uh, a, a very, it, it's very possible that the Romani people went from Central India to Northwestern India in the second half of the first millennium. And then further on from Northwestern India, where they might have stayed at quite a, uh, quite a long time, because impact into phonology and all the kind of stuff um, takes time, and then they moved on uh, 
do the uh, do the then um, one Sassanid empire, and we see this with birds. So, uh, for example, that uh, there are approximately thousand birds of pre-European as uh, thousand roots of pre-European origin in the Romani language, and eighty percent of these pre-European roots are, fr are from uh, are from Indo-Aryan languages. So, for example, it's come the son, it's prior brother, it's pan sister, it's. Uh, man, if you go for the cardinal numbers, it's yek tui trin star panch, shof, and then come three Greek ones: enya, uh, efta, ochto, enya, and then again desh, uh, which is Indo-Aryan. Uh, but giving you this Greek example, it already shows if. Uh, if cardinal numbers are, are substituted from another language, then this other language must have had a big impact on the uh, uh, on Romani. And this means uh, that uh, after going through the Armenian sphere, where they have words like uh, hip or kotor, kotor is the piece, hip is the lid for the uh, for the bot, and even uh, uh, from this phase, they also have the word krast or kra for horse from the Armenian, uh, from the Armenian language, uh, the Greek influence must have been very, very massive because it was also in, in Greece when, when Romani became the first, uh, started to become Europeanized because today Romani is something like a, a Europeanized language. You know, in Hindi, it's still that uh, you have the, the subject, the object and the verb at the end. I tried to say this sentence, Maine Larki Deki, I saw the girl. In Romani, it's Metiklom Rakia. I saw girl and not I girl saw. And this is a massive, uh, this is a mess, when such a thing is a massive man impact if the, uh, when if the basic syntactic order gets changed. So this must be, uh, this shows that the Europeanization already start in Byzantine Greek. And, and from this on, Romani became uh, a Europeanized Indo-Aryan language, which it still is. And it's still spoken, I think, by at least a quarter of the Romani population of Europe, which also, uh, uh, which on the one hand shows uh, the, uh, the, uh, the assimilatory pressure, the Romani people were, were oldest, uh, on the other hand, it also shows the resilience because uh, Romani people always had to speak. When grown up Romani people are always bilingual. There are no monolingual uh, Roman uh, grown up Romani speakers because Roma always have had, had to live and have to live from the majority population. So they have to be in contact with them. They have to speak their language. And this impact shaped uh, the, Romani, uh, uh, the Romani dialects of Europe according to certain regions. And this we know already since the, I think since the 18th century, the Romani people were, uh, were spread all over Europe in a way we still can see today. Uh, they, of, at the beginning of the 16th century, they were spread all over Europe. All, they had reached each European territory. And from this time on, uh, they are, more or less stable in their regions, and we still can see this uh, uh, with their dialects. So, as Miriam said, uh, and also there are only uh, maximum one third, and let's say one quarter of the Romani population speaking Romani, just that they stick to stuck to Romani so long, and uh, and uh, are still speaking this Indo-Aryan shaped language. Uh, shows quite the resilience on the one hand. On the other hand, it also, it's a sign of the exclusion until now. Um, and if you want, um, and you really can, uh, uh, can see that, uh, man, as I said, we don't know really, and not exactly how the Romani, uh, why the Romani people left India, how they left India, and when they left India. But uh, this glottochronology, as we call it, uh, uh, helps a little bit uh, to trace this back. And, uh, and also there are other, uh, other opinions that the Roma are descendants from the Kshatriya who were uh, 
uh, uh, who, uh, who were taken into slavery by Mahmoud von Razna and, and then traded on to Europe and all the kind of stuff. We only know that they are of, of, of Indo-Aryan origin. They might have been uh, uh, in, the, in the second half of the first millennium in the central Indo-Aryan sphere migrated to the Northwest Indo-Aryan uh, Indo sphere, moved through, uh, through the Sassanid Iran and through Armenian territories uh, uh, to the Byzantine Greek Empire, and then uh, reached Europe from the late 14th, early 15th century on and spread all over Europe until the 16th century. And then, are separated into various, into various dialect groups, which we still can find today, and which all have this, uh, these pre-European uh, words. And on the other hand, which, uh, uh, which still have the, uh, the Indo-Aryan structure in the declension system, in the verbal system, and so on. Uh, um, Mr. Halbox, can I interrupt you here? I would like to... Yeah, for sure, you always can interrupt me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you said Indo-Aryan. Uh, can you tell us something about the background of uh, our special guest, Harris Toika, where his family came from, especially when his DNA has been tested out over here. And it has been, you know, from, uh, uh, he was like, uh, they said the family came and was, uh, was, was uh, in for some, quite some two decades or more, no. Uh, more than uh, more than hundred years or something like that. So maybe if you could kindly, you know, throw some light on that, and then I can ask our musician to, you know, uh, play a small number for all of us, so that we can, you know, invite afterwards. We can invite our Indian guest also. So pr first, if you could kindly tell us about his family background. Or where, or where and how they descended from, if you know, I mean. Um, I know a little bit. Uh, so, uh, Manhari's man, man, man man family clan is, uh, man, and is from the so-called Lovari. Uh, Lovari uh, are, um, uh, are flag Roma, so they belong to these Roma who have been in, in, in bondage and slavery in the Romanians, in the Romanian sphere, and in the neighboring Romanian sphere, until the 18th, uh, until the late 18th, until the 19th century, it seems up. But um, as they are, uh, as his dialect, Lovari, or his language, is quite influenced by Hungarian, they came through a, uh, through the Hungarian uh, uh, through the Hungarian territory. And moved and moved west, and I think they are. Uh, his family might have been among the first families who reached what is today Burgenland. I think his aunt Chaya Stoika, she has been born in the uh, in the Sevinki region, and the family had been living there. So uh, they belong to, um, and he belongs to this family clan, who is something. Uh, well, let's say they are. Uh, it was the most important, one of the most important Romani families in Austria, because they were the ones uh, who uh, his aunt, his uncle, and also his uh, man, uh, man, his aunt Chaya, uh, his his uncle Karl, and his father Mongo. They were among the they were concentration camp survivors who really made a big impact on the Austrian society by going into arts. And by going into schools and talking to children about, about what happened. So they are very prominent figures. There are films about all of them. There are books from all of them. And they are now part of, uh, let's say, Austrian history uh, and, and have shaped to, uh, to a great extent the Austrian, uh, and let's say, the Austrian public mind with respect to Roma. And, and, and Harry descends from this family, but he's, first of all, I think he's musician, and then he's wrong. Am I right? <laughs> he's not talking now. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, Harry is supposed to. Yeah. Harry, hi. <laughs> Harry? Can you turn unmute? That's Peter. 
So we're gonna play a song for you, okay? Sorry? We play a song for you now, okay? Oh, <laughs> okay. yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harry. Thanks, thanks, Peter, and thanks, Valerie. Uh, uh, Harry, you want to speak something? Pardon? Do you want to say something? Well, first I want to say welcome and good afternoon in India. I had the pleasure to play very, very many concerts in your beautiful country from Shillong to Goa. And Munish was our leader and our, he was a great man. He helped us very, very out. And, and when we get in trouble sometimes, he was always there for us and very helpful. Many, uh, Munish thanks a lot for that. And I hope uh, we can play uh, good music for you tonight, uh, today, <laughs> sorry. And uh, to give you a, few, uh, a short inside look of what we're playing here in Austria, which is, and, and, uh, Tita Harbach's uh, 
said everything what what is about to say about my family i mean there's nothing nothing to it thank you when is your next visit to india well, when is your next visit to india well, it's up to you monish <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we we when, have. I, I, mean, I had you. Over... you I, I really get oh, what's, what's that? <laughs> I had you over I'm now to. Very sentimental about the good food and uh, you know very very nature with the love the lovely nature over there in India and but it's also very hot in Vienna now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well. So, so thanks a lot for invitation. Well, let's see uh, if if everything goes well. We'll have you soon here with your group. In the meanwhile, what I'll do is I'll request Mr. Achal Pandya to invite Mr. Anil to speak about uh, about on the on the on the topic. Uh, Dr. Achal Pandya, may I hand over to you? Thank you, uh, Mr. Munish. Uh, Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Sir Anil, uh, I would like you to speak about the cultural traditions of uh, Romas today. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, similarity between tribes living uh, in India and Romas uh, from the anthropological uh, point of view. I would also like uh, uh, that you speak on the studies about the ancient wisdoms that uh, Romas are carrying and similar types of uh, the ancient wisdoms are still uh, prevalent in India and are really used uh, almost on daily basis. Uh, and you can also talk about the social structure of Roma community and its semblance uh, with the community in, uh, in uh, South Asia. Thank you, uh, Professor Achal. A very good evening to all. And Buna Gia to Austria. As you know that I was uh, trying to, you know, develop an socio-cultural profile of Roma community when I was going through this huge literature which, which was available. And uh, as earlier speakers said that, you know, when you see the name identity and distribution of the Roma community itself. You know, it has a, a very, very long history as the Roma is a very large, you know, heterogeneous diaspora where there are many subgroups, you know, that are there among the communities. And also they have called with very different names, uh, which, you know, uh, they, generally Roma people, they doesn't like to prefer to call them like that. So as the literature is available, Roma are known with a very different, uh, you know, names and uh, they are present everywhere in the world. And they are also, you know, uh, have a different uh, groups in different countries. Uh, and today we are uh, there are estimated about uh, 12 to 15 million Romani communities, but I don't think, uh, I think bigger than this population is available because most of the data in the literature is, you know, uh, missing and we cannot uh, enumerate the population where the population is migrating from so long, from 1500 years ago. So it is not possible us to enumerate the whole population. That is one reason I strongly believe. And as I said that, uh, and also earlier speaker, he said in Austria, there are ap approximately 50,000. I think maybe, I think more than that, uh, the population they have. And there are many stories about, you know, the migration about this community, uh, namely, you know, the thousand years ago, and there is a lot of missing link between uh, the research also, because we just cannot, uh, uh, unless and until we do uh, in-depth study about this community, we cannot come up with the exact figure and exact information about how they migrated as earliest because there is a lot of missing link that from where they have come. But we have also stories like, you know, uh, there was a, a king monarch called Barham Gaur who was imported, you know, thousand to 12,000 musicians and dancers from India. And that is how people say uh, Roma, Romani have migrated from there. And 
some stories that because of Mohammad Ghazini, uh, he wanted some soldiers or he wanted some workers, uh, laborers, and all kind of things. So that's how they have uh, imported to their different uh, countries like Arabian countries like Persia and all that. And uh, when uh, the king uh, Barham Gaur has, you know, like uh, they used to call these people who they imported from India called Jot. Jot is a, in Arabic, it is like uh, they said Jot in Arabic. But if you, uh, if you see in the dictionary, the Jot uh, resemblance with the Jat. So in that way, we can say many of the Jat communities that are there in the central India have been migrated. And we can say uh, by looking their appearance and also about by looking the culture, especially the earlier speaker, uh, they talk on language. So uh, one is the uh, Roma language belongs to Indo-European and Indo-Aryan. If you see these two languages, families, and this is more similar with the, you know, uh, subgroups of uh, uh, Indian uh, languages like Urdu, Punjabi, Hindi, uh, and uh, when the Romani uh, community, if you see the counting of numbers, uh, like one, two, three, four to 10, they're mostly similar to Indian counting itself. And also, if you see the words of like Nag, Khan, Bal, all these are the similar words, which we can say that most of the communities, you know, they uh, speak, uh, like Hindi only. And the migration route of Roma people is still unknown. And so we can only find out many of this information. Uh, so on uh, influence on, you know, ling linguistic influence, because this is the only way we can construct the migration uh, uh, of, from the linguistic point of view. When it comes to physical appearance, if you see uh, during the age of, you know, exploration and colonization, uh, many people, they arrived there with the uh, European settlers. Uh, most of the people now, uh, there must have a lot of changes up among the communities because of migration, but they were mostly look like uh, black color hair, black eyes, and brown and British color of skin uh, and complexion was there. Uh, look like, just like, look like Indians. So after that, apart from this, so many anthropological, you know, researchers, they studies, uh, uh, you know, genetics to prove them that they are Indian and uh, Madam is here. So I no need to tell that because a lot of genetic research has also done uh, by anthropologists and also some social structure research has been done from anthropological perspective, historian, and also from a sociological perspective. So when this genetic study is based uh, on this unpa uh, uniparietal markers, such as mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome established in South Asian origin of Roma population. So the authors of 2012 uh, studied, you know, and analyzed some around 80 lakh uh, Romani uh, people uh, and one, 152 Romani people group. Uh, and uh, they, the study says that uh, the genetics uh, is completely similar to the Indian culture, Indian people. So because of their diverse nature and migration, they do not have, you know, a written history. Therefore, experts can only infer uh, their history through linguistic historical records and also on other nations they contacted uh, with their uh, genetic investigations so that we can know that exact uh, uh, when they migrated. So there is a lot of studies, uh, genetic studies is taking place in Anthropological Survey of India. So we can also you know, recommend them to take uh, uh, more uh, genetical studies in this community. And when it comes to occupation, it's more, more or less, it's very similar kind of occupation that Indian uh, groups or Indian people, they have. Like the Romas have traditional uh, craftsmen. They are traditionally craftsmen. They were blacksmiths. They were basket making. They were cobblers. They were tinsmith and horse dealers, tool makers. If you see this uh, occupation, and they were mostly nomadic and uh, semi-nomadic lifestyle, which many of the Indian tribes, you know, they... Uh, follow this kind of uh, life, lifestyle. So Romani kept their tradition uh, and also they were, uh, they were very performers like as our, uh, they performed and they were also involved in sculpture, jewelry making and practical metal arts uh, to continue to be the strong component of Romani culture. Because what I believe is like, uh, because when they migrated early in Europe, 
that time it was you know feudal system was there so because of that feudal system maybe romani community have been you know uh, spelled out from the countries or maybe they asked them to migrate somewhere else. so because of that some of the culture they able to retain among themselves otherwise there is lot of changes have been taken place and romanis are very much recognized uh, as excellent singers musicians and dancers and many roma are born artists repeat because many of you may don't know for example mrs rawa and mrs reshma are renowned you know romani singers chal chaplin as our sir says and also the chal chaplin is a best film actor uh, and there are many renowned roma personalities like painter pablo picasso is a, you know an entertainer elvis uh, presley hollywood icon michael caine there there are there are the very you know very renowned there are tennis players and now maybe because of you know the changes in the community uh, now they are shift from their uh, traditional occupation to you know so many romas are now doctors engineers and they are popular scientists in uh, nasa if you take if you see the social structure if you see the anthropological record shows striking resemblance between the cultures of different indian groups of roma people and roma people have same social structure which is practiced in india that is like they have vast kinship ties kinship relationship they maintain a kinship relationship uh, which you know it is a similar to indian culture and also the uh, there is a head of the family of the eldest person which in indian culture we see and even till today the chief of roma called as a takur in some places takur so and also old lady is known as a, a puri diya so these are the few you know social structure and this all social structure you know similarities with uh, roma and other communities of india like banjara gujjars jats gadi tribe rajput and dhangar and also some other community called huna huna is a semi nomadic community which was you know ruling in western india and particularly rajasthan and they marched towards the eastern europe and founded in hungary so there are evidences are there only we need to find the link uh, of this evidences and you know uh, give the exact uh, 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 result of this research so when it comes to religion definitely due to migration and also due to surrounding of various culture uh, they have you know uh, for instance most romans adopted dominant religion area wherever it is there and many romans romanis in the middle east and iran are muslims and in south america most are catholic in north america and uh, in western europe they are protestants but still in europe and uh, various other countries romani follow certain kind of hindu religion some hindu rituals they follow and some uh, kind of tribal customs still they have in their traditions so when it comes to customs and traditions the romas are you know now it is uh, discastified now they are doing all sorts of work earlier there was a particular occupation was there uh, but now they have changed into you know they are they are into every kind of occupation and uh, roma recognize uh, three tribal uh, divisions among themselves that is kaladars from balkans and central europe who are the most numerous roma people and the gitonis mostly from the iberian peninsula northern africa and southern france and also one is manus sinti uh, from france and germany if you see this uh, word sinti manus these are all very much similar and related to the hindu culture and the cultural similarities between the roma and indian communities includes the chris of roma followed old panchayat system and the roma worship hindu goddess kali durga in some of the parts of the country which they call sat uh, saraha and the rituals like uh, you know hindus they follow and they believe in shiva kali and agni uh, they consider themselves you know like uh, links these all consider the links to the hindu culture a big they also celebrate a big uh, cultural festival uh, in france every year uh, like our, how we celebrate the durga puja 
and they also you know worship and take to the procession to the sea to symbolical immersion in water as done during durga puja in india but only the difference between we will just immerse and come back but roma people they come back with the same idol they don't just for a symbolically they will immerse but they come back with the same idol and they worship regularly and according to our roma scholar uh, janardan patania says that the way of life from birth to death that is called rites of passage of the roma community almost similar to the india and for example like very very simple examples are there roman women when it gives child birth is considered to be impure uh, a baby and mothers you know stay separately like how in our many of the our indian communities and indian tribals they follow this kind of things impurity and they separately stay for 40 days and she also pro- prohibited to you know not to touch anybody so these are the few practices and after 40 days they go for bathing and cleaning and they have a you know ceremony called molisaran molisaran ceremony uh, they pray to the god and a, a senior woman tie a red thread on the wrist of the mother and the child similarly in hindu women in hindu community the uh, all this uh, rituals follow the only thing is in uh, romani they call molisaran but in india they call moli the same ritual which they follows and roma also you know in the night time uh, keep burning candle and lamp near the bed uh, you know of the sleeping mother and child because it is the same thing because in our indian culture also we follow this to just you know award of the evil spirits from the mother and child when they you know give deli- in, at the time of the delivery they also consider weeping infant loudly is also considered as a some kind of evil spell so these are the very very small examples i am giving to understand that how the roma culture is very much similar to the indian cultures uh, like indian communities and also tribes in india especially i found this kind of uh, similarities very much in indian tribes because i am an anthropologist i have studied many tribes so these are the one among them and also roma uh, women use uh, amulets and magical objects to keep away the ghosts and evil spirits from the mother and child and they believe both are susceptible to the evil spirit so everywhere uh, everywhere in india they follow this because whenever there is a small infant they are very much afraid of you know this evil and magic and all kind of things so uh, like this they charm they uh, put uh, uh, kalak black soot on the child forehead and same similar like in india uh, kalak is the similar fashion on the forehead of the child to you know get away from the evil and also the bad eyes uh, you know somebody bad eyes so this is one of the important thing and many many very very important thing is the roma woman always hold her child to her breast and never to the back which is familiar within indian hindu women ways because why i am saying this there is an a study by anthropologist uh, i don't remember exactly but whoever doesn't follow this kind of practices those children become aggressive they are not so emotional so there was a study in some different country because many of the country uh, in, in many of the countries the child will sleep separately from mother they have a different uh, room or maybe different place but roma have the similar kind of practices like you know india they follow and this is very much important and it has been proved also because uh, so many cultural anthropologists they studied how a children become aggressive so this is one of the best example they have studied and members of each sub tribes uh, they tend to get you know among marry among themselves they have endogamous characteristics among them like uh, our tribes in india every tribe they follow endogamous so they marry in their own community I'll, uh, they are the monogamous i'll, I'll uh, uh, stop you here thank you uh, no 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 just for a while yeah. i'm not uh, stopping you actually uh, i just wanted to ask you one uh, one thing that as uh, it was it a discrimination uh, of romas or romas were like uh, in india also we have got so many communities like parsis they don't uh, go outside yes. maybe uh, that was a discrimination from romas to the outside world they wanted to keep the 
what 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 are what are your views about it that uh, it was a discrimination from the uh, from the outside world or did they did not want to intermingle with no no it is, it was completely discriminated from the outside world why i'm saying because because of no roma's migration because of roma's cultural uh, customs practices many of the other country communities they were not liking and they were discriminating in all the way every every aspect they were discriminating to the i told you know because of uh, in earlier in europe there was a feudal system where they spelled out all kind of you know tortured they made uh, to roma community i mean like sorry uh, yeah. dr anil i like to make a point out over here that whatever we are hearing is anti roma you know that they were in holocaust that they were but there has been a time you know where i, I would like to read that that the europeans who first encountered the romani people greeted them warmly uh aristocrats who met romani in 15th century gave them letters of protection to travel from one country to another and from there started the romani people movement and picking up the religion so why this particular aspect is not discussed why is it only the uh, aspect you know that they were you know uh, mistreated or persecuted but this particular part is never you know uh, this is a question to professor halbax also is he professor halbax maybe i can answer this question by saying uh, when the roma first came to europe they used a pattern the europeans were very familiar with because uh, at the end of the middle ages the europeans went for uh, for a pilgrimage to the holy land yeah? and the roma were uh, 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 were copying these patterns to some extent they always had to make a living out what they uh, even in the best way possible so they said they are pilgrims uh, who uh, who came uh, uh, who stole the nail of the cross of christ and therefore they have to roam five years through the uh, uh, through the uh, uh, through the world and uh, and being homeless and it was and it was the duty of every christian to give to a pilgrimage uh, uh, to give to a pilgrim a place to sleep a, a, a something to eat something to drink and all the kind of stuff and this explains why the romani people were welcomed by the cities like nuremberg or or other big cities and in and we find in their registers what they have been given and what the stories were they were telling and this was always something with pilgrimage so they copied a pattern uh, which they saw from europeans going to the uh, uh, to the middle east on pilgrimage when going uh, when coming to europe and therefore were welcomed in this pattern of medieval very very christian and catholic europe the moment uh, europe went into enlightenment and this pattern was abandoned uh, this restricted uh, uh, let's say this pattern did not work anymore and therefore uh, 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 they were seen as hostile by trying to do this further on is this an explanation well yeah it says i'm mean, close i would rather say so no i mean and all this uh, and all these letters issued uh, by protection by sigismund from luxembourg to them this was one uh, this was one letter saying everywhere where a certain guy comes with his people uh, and they called him a duke uh, duke uh, andreas shows up with his people you have to welcome them this was one letter of conduct which was given to to one group of romani people by sigismund of luxembourg in hungary and which then may might have been copied and used on with other groups and this worked for a short time the moment this uh, 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 this uh, this attitude of the nobility was gone and the power of sigismund was gone uh, this protection was gone thank you on that case uh, yeah it says something but on the other hand you know i my question still remains the that what was it that we highlight only the you know the negative side 
of 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 uh, of the romanis you know where we find them they are you know thieves the coets or whatever you know uh, prostitutes or what and at the same time there has been uh, you know a, a time where you know they were uh, very close to the nobility aristocrats and were being held and this is yeah. uh, something which and when it is this no, I mean, the thing is uh, that they always were, uh, uh, from, from society, they always were perceived as outsiders, not belonging to, uh, not belonging to, uh, to the European culture, alien. Uh, they were seen as spies of the Ottomans, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, and all the kind of stuff. On the other hand, they always were curious, a curious nobleman uh, who, uh, uh, who settled them on their estates. One of them was Archduke Joseph, Stoika, as <laughs> his name was, Archduke Joseph, at the end of the 19th century, uh, who settled Roma on his Hungarian estates. And there are even letters in Romany written to the Archduke, uh, 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 which are published. But this is, uh, 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 this is the other side of it. It's romantic curiosity about the other, on the one hand, which is in rare cases, and, and the general population, but goes for uh, uh, discriminating the other as alien and terrible. These are two, uh, two sides of one medal, where the other side is a very, very small one. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Amin. Yeah, yeah I, I just know. one intervention I want to uh, bring into notice of everybody, 10 years of London and UK. Now, when we talk about the derogatory uh, comments and their uh, kind of reputation the gypsy camps have, uh, I also have a couple of flats in, uh, there. Wherever there is a redevelopment land and the gypsy camps were there, the land was cheaper and was taken as a land bad because uh, of their tap their character, their living standards, their hygiene. I mean, sorry to say, the Romaniath and the Romani romanticism which we have for Rabadis and Lombardis of Hyderabad looking so decked up is all not there in the rest of Europe. Things have changed drastically and uh, gypsies, unfortunately, do not now uh, enjoy that kind of reputation. Uh, uh, Minister, I would like to just uh, actually come uh, speak, in fact, add to what you were saying. Yes. Uh, at whatever is happening today or in the last uh, three or four centuries uh, about the persecution, about discrimination towards Romas and all, with their, but my uh, personal opinion is that uh, these uh, Romani people or the Roma uh, community, they were all skilled people. They, they, they were carrying some skills with them. So uh, when you are carrying a skill uh, with yourself, even today they would be carrying a skill. Uh, we saw a beautiful performance. Uh, it's a skill. So it's really impossible that they would be completely discriminated uh, forever because skill will always uh, will survive. In fact, uh, the legend says that when uh, Alexander... Uh, he came to India and uh, and Porus, the Indian king, when he lost the war, uh, he gifted Alexander with the, the blades of uh, uh, steel blades from which the uh, swords were made. And uh, Alexander was quite impressed and he took with, with him a lot of uh, blacksmith with him. And so this is one of the theory how the, uh, the sword making uh, craft or art I'll call it an art. It is a quite a complex process of making a, a sword, uh, which reached uh, in Middle East and became popular as uh, Damascus swords. And if today, uh, it is impossible with all this technology to make a Damascus sword that they used to make in uh, uh, in three twenty six. Uh, before common era and uh, as uh, late as in 17th century, we have Sikli girls in India. Sikli girls is a community of, uh, of swordsmiths uh, in India, in Rajasthan, in Punjab, in Haryana, in uh, different places who are working with metal. 
but they are not able to create the same type of uh, of source which uh, we were producing because if you will go to the uh, uh, tosha khana of alwar or um, in baroda or in uh, uh, jodhpur jaipur bikaner anywhere you will find damascus sword great some damascus sword their uh, pieces but if you try to make with all these scientific equipment scientific uh, uh, analysis thing you are not able to replicate it somebody tried but uh, he has come closer but not uh, to replicate it so there is a is a loss of knowledge and wisdom what they say is that uh, that is uh, in india there is a place in karnataka from where uh, a wood steel used to be to be uh, excavated and this steel used to go uh, to all these places for uh, making the damascus swords and now we do not have the source of that wood steel and uh, we do not know how this actually there is a process where uh, the steel is folded beaten folded beaten heated up quenched and then only you are able to develop it's very it's like a samurai uh, samurai sword so, I, so there were this this is just an example uh, metallurgy or the uh, metal smithy is one of the examples but there were there were skill, other skills also as madam mentioned uh, the rabari and all they uh, are making the beautiful the most beautiful textiles of the world which uh, which will maybe uh, are one step above any uh, fashion uh, cities of the which is cities of the world whether it is paris and all so it's about the skill so i really agree with you that we should also talk of the uh, the good things and uh, uh, yes of course they were persecuted there is no in fact we don't need any proof we all know that and they uh, Uh, they were discriminated and they are today also uh, in some places discriminated uh, so that's the, the bad thing but we should also talk of the uh, the, 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 this, the we should celebrate the uh, the roma community and uh, i would also like you to speak about how what what do they do when uh, uh, roman romas they die uh, is there any semblance in their yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. there are many resemblances in death rituals of roma community in india because when roma man dies or anybody dies in their family uh, they kept alone him in the small tent or maybe in the room just like how indian does and you know many of the children small children they sent to their cousins or neighbor or maybe you know their uncles houses because they keep away you know small kids from a deceased person body and also the roma dead body is left alone in the room and like just like how indian follow say uh, the window of the room is kept little open and they keep you know tumbler of water and also a kind of food they keep it to the soul to be a, you know last drink or you know kind of food to depart the soul and that's how you know they follow and then they shut the door and the indian hindu people also do like you no know, they uh, put the jug of water near by the body and they also have you know they give the roma give the dead man souls his last food or onward journey to the god they keep plate full of you know food and that's how in so many tribals you must have observed that whenever they take dead body they take all kinds of grains with them and throwing on the road so that in the in his uh, after he dying he should not get a uh, deficiency of food to him throughout his you know even in soul so the whole uh, night they also sit in front of the dead body they discuss good things about the dead person uh, and many things they discuss about him and also they they dress up specially at the time of death ritual they wear white uh, dresses and they take give the mourn to the bodies thank you thank you so much um, Take over. Uh, we have been talking about the past. We have been talking about the rituals, the skills, a number of other things. Uh, now I would like to request Magister Caroli if she is there. 
she's gone? Uh, Miriam had to leave. She, uh, she, she only was in her job. Uh, I, I think she wrote us. Uh, she was in her job and she was only allowed to participate with her presentation and, and, slow, and shortly afterwards. Sorry. Okay. Fine. Well, uh, we'll thank her uh, separately. Uh, uh, last but not the least, they, we open up the floor for the question hour. So we will be able to take only because of the time constraint, we are two or three questions. But before that, I'll request uh, Mrs. Rama Pandey and uh, Professor Halbachs to kindly uh, say the present day situation of uh, Romas in the society or the society where they've been living. I may I request Mrs. Roma, uh, Rama Pandey first to Roma come. Pandey. Roma Pandey. <laughs> so uh, I mean, if you could just, but very briefly, yeah. so that we take. Uh, I already, uh, from my personal experience, I already uh, underlined the uh, social discrimination in so-called civilized world of Europe between them and gypsies are bad. It, it, it's a bad relationship. It's, it's not a healthy relationship. And uh, this, this sounds very romantic, very uh, pleasant to us to listen about them. I would say our Rabadis, our Lombardis, our uh, Gadovia, Luhar, all Gumantu uh, tribes which we have are far better uh, my, and in, in the society than them. Gypsies are in Europe in general, in Britain in particular, are an outcast society. This is the present situation. And nobody wants to mingle with them. They are taken as a now, unfortunately, even to utter these words, I feel ashamed uh, that they think it's a criminal tribe. Uh, they, for any theft, for anything which happens um, other than the uh, so-called black people, the uh, first people to be arrested or uh, inquired about or questioned about is gypsy community. Gypsy camps are not much visited, are visited only when people need entertainment. And that's why they are served that kind of, uh, unfortunately, the drugs, homemade liquors, which are part of now gypsy uh, trainings, which are never there in Rabadis and Lombardis and Raggers of, of uh, Barbie, Jaisalmer, uh, Ran of Karch, Karnataka, Punjab. It never happened that way in our uh, nomadic tribes, our uh, um, so-called Romas, our Central Aryan tribes. If you dig being a student of history, there's only one thing. They were all Central Asian Aryans who migrated for various reasons from here to the uh, rest of the world. Then they have gone, the African uh, area should be uh, now researched thoroughly. If something is left, it is in that side, which I would recommend to all uh, people who are knowledgeable here, that they should try and find the Roman roots in Africa, Today's uh, position, I was very uh, sorry, I uh, accept and confess that I did not know that Pablo Picasso had this leading. So, uh, nice to know that. But th this is one of the rare names we are taking. Uh, so we, we say that the exceptions don't make the rule of the society. The society is taken in general. So present day situation is pathetic. It's not something to look, uh, to look up to. I, if given a chance or a power or a med medium or mean, I would like to do something for these Roman children who are now global children and need to be looked after and educated and given at least dignity of, of being a human being. That's what I would like. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Roma Pandey. <laughs> Uh, Professor Halwax, before we end, uh, your views, please. Uh, on the one hand, I have to agree with Mrs. Ramabandi, which is completely, when she gave the completely right thing, but we have a twofold situation in Europe. On the one hand, 
during the last 50 years, and this is uh, the Romani emancipation movement, uh, they succeeded that uh, on national and supranational levels, uh, that the, uh, there is an awareness that Roma have a problem, yeah? that they are not only that they are not a problem, they have problems. And European Union and Council of Europe have many initiatives uh, to, to, to help Roma, to try to educate Roma, to improve the situation. But if we look on the ground, and especially in, in countries with a, 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 with, a high number, with a high number of Roma, we have discrimination and we have Romani Mahalas, which are worse than the slums of South Africa, of South America, and so on. I have, I have visited these slums and the living conditions are there. Let's say 90% of the people are jobless. Uh, they have, they have, uh, uh, the kids have no future. Also, they get education. They get no jobs because they are gypsies. And, uh, and in some of these countries uh, with the high Romani population and with the high Romani segregation, there is even something like uh, a, a very subtle genocide running so that uh, they get money from the state, but they don't get so much money from the state that they can make a good living and they have nothing to do. So the males usually go into alcoholism, into drugs. And if they are married and if they have children, uh, they get more money. So they are marrying quite early, having children quite early just to get more money. And this money again is, uh, uh, this is the spiral of, uh, of social malaise uh, uh, where Europe really is guilty that they are they are killing people they are uh, uh they are forgetting the future of these kids and they are uh, are trying to do something for these kids but never never implementing it fully politically i was working in these jobs in the southern balkans for european union and so on and uh and it's a shame that and sometimes it's really a shame to be europe and if this mrs rambabandi said uh, this so-called so uh, uh, this so-called uh, social and civilized states. She's completely right because uh, what we are doing with these peoples in centuries, it's a shame for Europe. Uh, thank you very much. And now the floor is open. We have two questions we can take or three. It's not a question. It's a it's a submission to the panel members that uh, from linguistic point of view, as we have seen that uh, uh, it is mentioned that pre-European times, more than 80% words belong to the Indo-Aryan category of languages. So in this, in this category, we have the um, Persian language and Sanskrit language. So there are much similarities between both the languages and with the migration of, of the Roma community through the ages, through the centuries, do we see that linguistic migration of the words that is common between the Sanskrit and Persian. Like we have, like we say, uh, when Persian came here, they don't pronounce compound words like bha, cha, dha. So they pronounce sinti, sindhi to sindhi. That the same way, like uh, they say beam for fear, but it's the beam in Sanskrit. Likewise, we have more than 500 words in Sanskrit and Persian language are common. So I, I just wish to know, know that while the migration took place, uh, so how these words, they also uh, transported, migrated from Indo-Aryan family to the uh, present day Roma language. Uh, do you want me to answer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, man, uh, man, you have now you have been now talking about the the aspiration uh, in in the Indo-Aryan languages, which is preserved in Romani. For example, uh, there is a difference between the, uh, the house is care in Romani. It's it's ka, and uh, and uh, this this is uh, let's say the 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 aspirated media. So the the voiced ones are preserved as voiceless in Romani. This is one of the traits which shows that Roman is an Indo-Aryan language, that these things are preserved. It's also with the number one, which is yek, I mean, an aspiration, uh, which, is, uh, which is an aspiration after the K. So this is preserved. 
Uh, this is one of the features which is uh, which you really have, but uh, uh, but you only have it in in words of Indo-Aryan origin. This means you have it in uh, in uh, or for example, pen uh, pen the sister from Bagini. I think uh, this is uh, there. You have it, and there are all, and there are also other things which is the noun declension. But this is quite complicated because I mean, Hindi has uh, has for example a, a, a and erectus and then obliquus and then postpositions. Yeah, Romani has the same erectus and obliquus. And instead of postpositions, they have grammaticalized postpositions, which are suffixes again, and which shows the whole Indo, the new Indo-Aryan system in the Deglantian system. But this is highly complicated. Uh, there is even. Uh, if you want to know this a little bit more detailed, there is a there are fact sheets on Roma by the Council of Europe. You only have to put in uh, Roma facts, uh, Council of Europe, and then you get to these fact sheets. And there you have, I think, seven fact sheets about language, where all of these phenomena are presented. But this is man, this is man, this is very well known, and this is what makes Romani so interesting uh, for Europeans. There is still this Indo-Aryan core. Which is on the uh, which is the morphology. There are some phonological specialities which come from Indo-Aryan languages, like this aspirated stops, and then there is this pre-European lexicon of basic vocabulary, which is also to eighty percent Indo-Aryan. Thank you, Professor. Uh, second question, uh, the lady over there, please. Little two. So once again, good evening, everyone. My name is Vidhu Magu. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, Roma population, but I'm a sociologist and uh, I've been living in the Czech Republic, Prague, for nearly 25 years. I'm a professor there at the university. And uh, I do agree that uh, what I have observed there is that they are discriminated. There is segregation, unfortunately. But one positive aspect which I've seen is uh, when I visited uh, one of the Roma communities with my colleague who's been involved in a project to promote Roma music. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful to see all the little children, he was playing on the guitar and they were singing. And I was thinking when I was you know, hearing all this, I was thinking it would be great if more of such projects can come up and that would actually you know, give them an opportunity to use those skills because they're different skill sets that they have. And that's something that we really need because unfortunately there is a lot of discrimination which I have observed over the past nearly 25 years in Prague. Thank you very much. Uh, for your information, we have, uh, uh, we have, ma'am, you know, uh, a number of uh, programs uh, where Harry Stoika has been, you know, playing with, uh, uh, with the nomadic population of Rajasthan. And they have, you know, one of the late, uh, one of them was called Indian Express, and where he was tested, you know, DNA uh, or common DNA among both. And of course, Harry, due to certain reasons, couldn't come. But we always try to see if they come over, you know, and then perform with the Indian population, the Indian diaspora, especially from the same community. But thank you very much for the suggestion. Sir, over to you. Last question. My name is Kartar Kapoor. I'm a student of Comparative Studies and Evolution of History. I would like to make a few observations, if you allow me, sir. If you allow me. I, I need your permission for that. Because because a because lot have been said, and I can't go in detail, but I will only make observations. The first the children of India, the, some minister have said so. Why not offer them dual nationality as by offering to NRIs and others? And th this should be part, they should be given. They have, they, and the other one, the gentleman over said, how, why, and when they left India? And that is a big question. Everybody, everybody is very sure about whatever they say. And experts say how, why, and when they left India. And that, that is true. Not, but I'll come in another, another, another one. When you say they, they say they migrated, I object. 
they never migrated. This is a big question. Please, this is, this is pertaining to history. At that very moment, when they, when they say migrated, thought of the, about 15, uh, 100 years ago, everybody was invading India because it was a rich land, very small population and big wealth, prosperity everywhere. Every principalities were prospering. Why they should leave India? They, were, they never left India. The, the question is, whosoever innovators came, why they came here? They were interested in conversion, wealth, and slaves. That is three things they wanted. All of them, all of them, whosoever came, they settled there. Welcome. They all of them, except Jews. They never wanted, but Parsis and Jews never did that. All the other people, they all wanted wealth, slave, and conversion. These people, in the course, I submission is, they were taken as a slave because British also took slaves to West Indies. They also took to South Africa, to Fiji and other where. When it was happening in the 18th and 19th century, why did it happen in the, the, the 10th century? Easily, to, that was a, what you call feudal age. That was a feudal age. It could have been easily happened then. So, and there is a recorded, there is recorded evidence. There's recorded evidence, sir. It's for your information. Recorded evidence, people are coming out with it. Some innovator from the uh, Mediterranean area of the Middle East, he took these people, they, they, this is trying from Kannauj, Rajasthan, and Punjab, that is present Haryana. They, they, these states were not there. This triangle, these people were taken from this place. And they were taken as artisans, they were highly skilled people. They were highly skilled people. They were taken as slaves for their own interests, for their own interests. The women who were used to be taken and sold in the Middle East and all and all that, you know what they were. Why these people, they were taken as a, this recorded history, I'm talking about record. This long record, these were, and the, 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 the representatives of the, the, what you call the Roma community, the chiefs and I've, I've heard and I've, I've read, they say we belong to Kannauj and we were taken as slaves. They claim, because they say this is the record. It is, it is recorded history, some, the, the, some records have been left and they've been found that have been taken as slaves. So they've been taken as a slave. After Jews, they did in the, in the, somewhere in the Middle East Triangle over there, they started spreading out, spreading out to Europe, to Bosporus and the, where here and there. Balkans, they went to the Balkans. Over, and they were the most, most, these people were the most, they discriminated, prosecuted, and enslaved. Even in Europe, they were enslaved. They were enslaved here. They were enslaved in Europe. In some parts of the Europe, they were enslaved by the feudals. And then they ran away from there the, 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 in, in their clutches and spread out other way. So they were criminals. They said they were criminals. Yes, they were criminals. We made them criminals. Why? When we discriminate, prosecute, and enslave, man becomes a criminal. Mentality becomes criminal. You have to, we, the society, have turned them criminals. There's no doubt about it. They, they've been shambled. I've seen the photos and all those people. The little wretches, they, they're living everywhere in Europe. But you just, they were treated. And the Holocaust, it's been mentioned, and I know it is by fact, 6 million Jews, 500,000 of the gypsies, of the Romans, and 500,000 about the the homos and the bisexuals and the, 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 the what you call these prostitutes and all they were there was another one million they were persecuted but they see that the, the kind of person that you don't want to be criminal they, i met them i lived in europe for 15 years i met them and talked to them i found out about them it, this they are, this is this is fun so to say they were the that the, they have the migrated side they were never migrated they were taken away. You don't leave your country no, on the so, so you said another observation picked up religion on the way to Europe. No, sir, nobody picks up the religion. It is always enforced. It's always enforced. Throughout the history, the Red Indians, the Indians, the what, what you call everywhere in the world, it is never picked up. It is always enforced. They were, they were forced to accept. They were forced to accept their ways. They were not given wealth. They were, they were taken everything. They were taken away from them, and wealth was never given to them. Prosperity never came their way. They have to shun everything to survive. So they survived and gave away everything. They never migrated. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
but but still they carried their traditions that's uh, that's true the, the, the people in west indies are doing it the fishes they are doing it this everywhere they are doing it they adopted the religion pardon they adopted the religion yeah on the way they adopted the religion no sir sorry we'll sorry have a discussion no. over we'll Why? have a dis see observation never tells me so fine sir we'll yeah, have a yeah, we yeah. will we'll discuss over a cup of tea outside <laughs> and uh, we'll and i'll like to thank everybody for joining us and professor halwa thank you very much for joining us and for your time and uh, kindly come uh, also convey our thanks to madam Uh, Karoli, and I do. We have Harry somewhere around, or he's gone yeah, also. He should, end up with Harry, he should be there. So I'm the last Austrian standing, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Is Harry there? well uh, thank you everybody thanks a lot thanks to our panelists thanks to ignca thanks once again to mr radostech and, hey. and uh, perhaps i think so this was a good farewell gift the last uh, you know talk uh, which i hope we will continue and now there are number of thanks which we thought we might miss on somebody so we have uh put them on our uh, screen and we tried to thank whomsoever we could and if somebody has got missed we with folded hands say sorry but thanks to that person also and let's all join over a cup of tea at the end okay okay Thank you.